Sure. Right. So moved and seconded. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Sorry, who seconded it? I got a second. Yeah. Uh, Beth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. You can sit up here if you want. That'd be better. Right. Approval of uh, the previous month's minutes. Does uh, everybody got a copy? I assume. Does anybody have corrections or additions to the minutes? Going once. All right. If nobody has any changes to the minutes, let's have a motion to approve them. Motion to approve. Uh, Second. Marlene moves and um, she Sheila seconds. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Public. Is there any public here to be heard? All right. Uh, in the interest of our guests, we'll skip the old good news right now, and we'll go to the senior transportation needs. I wonder if you folks would introduce yourselves again and uh, you bet. tell us about your office and so forth. Absolutely. So, my name is Phil Greenwald. I'm the transportation planning manager with the city, so I do the long-term, long-range planning for the city. Um, we also work a lot with transit, and so I'm joined by Angel Bond, who's in the back. And uh, she works with Boulder County, and she'll introduce herself as well. And uh, I think really most of the comments and questions that you had really related to what Angel is doing currently in her programming. So she's got a lot of great information for you. I'm going to present real quickly up front. And, and sorry, Councilmember Martin, that you'll get to see this in a couple times. But um, we'll talk a little bit about microtransit and what that is and what that means for the senior population um, and the whole population of the city. So. It's not, it's not relegated to just one population at all. It's, it's really about uh, serving the entire city. So with that, I'm gonna go through a quick presentation. If you guys have any questions, let me know. We can stop any time, but I really wanna turn it over to Angel and get her uh, to introduce herself to you as far as from Boulder County after this is done and we'll, we'll be talking about the other needs you had uh, and the product uh, that Ronnie sent us. So um, people always ask what is microtransit? It's a great question because it's kind of a silly term almost. <laughs> I mean, people have small little tiny buses that zip around town. It is actually, it's a system of four to six vans. They can hold six passengers each. Um, you can use an app on your telephone, on your smartphone, or you can call and get the service. And the idea is that within um, about 30 minutes from making the request for your ride, this Uber Lyft type system, but but it's a more coordinated and more unified than that. We'll actually be able to come and pick you up kind of near your location where you're trying to get the, the, the transit service, like within a block uh, of your location, and then take you within 30 minutes to get you to your destination. So we're pretty excited about that idea. And this has been tried and true, uh, tried in many uh, different cities around the United States. And actually, Lone Tree is an example. I'll talk about that later too. But it has been, it, it is something, it's not just us trying something brand new that hasn't been tried. It is something that's out there. Yes, ma'am. So it's not door to door? It can be, but it typically is not. It's, it's like intersection to door or intersection to near location. Okay. Yeah. So there's some walk involved if, if necessary, but these vans do also uh, accommodate ADA services. So they are ADA accessible. Okay. So if, if, how far would they have to walk? Well, um, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's based on your mobility and, and what you what you can do. But what they're trying to do is get people to kind of get grouped in one location so they can do a group pickup or pick up people in generally the same location. So you don't have an empty or one person in the van only. You have a number of people using that service. So it is more like transit. And that's the transit piece of this, but it's not. Just individual, it's trying to group rides, and you may have to stop along your route and pick other people up. So it's not just you going from where you get picked up directly to where you're going. It could be you get picked up, you pick up some other folks, or you drop off some other folks, but in within 30 minutes, you should be able to get to your destination. So a little bit of sharing that has to happen here. <laughs> could we get a copy of your presentation? Absolutely. Yes. Good. So, uh, why why microtransit? <laughs> why microtransit? 
I'm um, sorry, these slides didn't come across as well on this cool guy. Then on, on the computer slide, you know, but um, it really is a dynamic system. Uh, it really can adapt to different conditions. So there's a lot of different things that it can do. It, it can, um, you know, based on demand, it can add shuttles. So it can remove shuttles if the demand is low. They can move them to other places. You can share with other cities or other towns. So um, it's, it's pretty dynamic that we've been trying to figure out how to like share some of these resources so that we're not taking on the entire lift of this, of this system. Uh, it's very similar to our bus shelter program where we contract out to a vendor, a private party vendor, and they basically take care of the system. We pay them to do that. It's all what they call turnkey. So the vendor does all the work. We, we sit back and we administer that work and we make sure that they get paid and if there's any complaints, we certainly take those and send, pass them on to the vendor. But it's really the city kind of stepping back and administering the program, having that kind of control, that we more control than RTD um, has from their central location, I think, in Denver. That's my opinion. And so um, we would have more control of it, but we would be putting it over to a third party vendor. So we, we control that level and location and services. Uh, obviously, we have to pay people, so we pay for that level of service, but uh, you know, we, can, we can see kind of how it goes, and if it's going well, we can talk about increasing the services and how we can get better service to folks, or if it's really too much coverage and, and you know, really too much supply and not enough demand, then we can reduce it to an additional again, there's uh, these existing microtransit models uh, serve cities very similar to one that don't have uh, major universities, uh, that, that are smaller in size, less than you know, 500,000 people, typically around 100, 200,000 people. And so we've seen that this has been very successful. So what are we doing right now? This, this may be a question uh, that you're going to answer, but what do these vehicles look like? What do they say on them? Well, they can say whatever we like. I mean, we can we can build it. How? Oh, you, this does not exist. Not in Longmont. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> that's what I needed to know. I'm well, it does that. it does exist in Longmont. I'll just explain how it exists in Longmont. Um, what we do is we have these current transit services, and RTD does a lot of the service. Um, again, based downtown Denver, we pay them sales tax. We also buy up local service. We provide the fixed routes that are the locals and the regionals. The locals are currently free. Access a ride is something they have to provide uh, in tandem with the, or in, in, in coordination with the fixed ride because it's a requirement that they provide ADA accessible service within mm -hmm. a certain uh, distance. And that just becomes the whole city at this point. So they provide that access a ride, but you have to qualify for that service. And I think a lot of people mm -hmm. know that, that that's mm -hmm. kind of a tough one to have to qualify for because you do have to go down to, I think it was, it used to be Wheat Ridge. I think it still is. I think it's like Littleton. Is it Littleton now? Yeah. It's Even about, further away? I don't know. Um, yeah, Angel, sure. if you, you know where. It's pretty much three quarters of a mile from all of RTD services. But where do you have to qualify? Where do you go to? Oh, to, now you have to go to Denver. I can talk a little bit okay. about that. Okay, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah. That's kind of contradictory, isn't it? I mean, if you're, if you're disabled, you right. have to go to Denver. Yeah. They'll come and pick you up. They'll pick you up. They'll drop yeah. you off. But we have to go down to that office talk to the people and get I can talk about that a little bit more in my session here. Also RTD provides flex ride service, which is very similar to this what we're talking about, but they provide like one to two vehicles typically in one. They say two. They also say they will only provide one vehicle What's in a day. So that's a one or two vehicles trying to make all these trips so they don't have that responsiveness that we're looking for. What's the difference between flex ride and accessory? Flex ride is open to anybody. Oh. I could I could go out there right now and I could I, I could call or get on my phone and, and hail a flex ride service. But it would probably say you've got you've got to wait four hours oh, yeah. for that service. But you know I could get service. And accessor ride is something where I'd have to qualify for it. And I'd probably have to set up that ride. We should talk more about that. Yeah, that needs it. But, is the senior center involved in this? I mean, do you have staff coordinating any of this, or is this directly between the We're the consumer, isn't it? Well, we work with the senior center as part of the city, you know, as a sure. city team. So sure. we would work with Ronnie and others to figure out how to make this best work. So as we're talking through the microtransit system, 
how we can do this. But we try to provide the resources that are out there today. And Angel does a great job too of getting those resources to the senior center and to the youth centers yeah. and the schools. To I'm make sure. I was just wondering if there's a focal point in the senior center. But well, we don't want to pass it down. So we give out the information. Okay. But, yeah. but it could be used as a place where people could catch the ride. So Absolutely. it could be a site. And it's also a destination. So it'll be a great mm -hmm. destination for a number of folks trying to get there. So. Right. Then there's VIA, which we provide a yearly payment to. They do paratransit only service, so they only provide service for older adults and people with disabilities. So that's, that's and, and Angel will talk more about that as well. And then we also have Transport, which is a service from Fort Collins. Uh, we give them a yearly payment as well to pay for a portion of their services that they provide to Longmont. They provide that regional flex bus, and it goes basically, we can only catch it from Longmont to Fort Collins and back, but it also provides service to Boulder. And with them being free, I think some people are taking advantage of that service without, they're not supposed to, but we, the Bolt is really supposed to provide that service, and that's over here in the regionals. Um, so those are kind of those things, and then what we're trying to do with microtransit is really, is really consolidate what's happening with the flex ride and really basically beef it up, make it better. And we've talked to RTD and we're working with a program right now, we'll talk more about this too, that, we're working in partnerships with some dollars from RTD and saying, hey, if we take some of this stuff over for you, we could both benefit by you saving money and giving us still some of the money that you would have spent on the program and put it into our new microtransit service. So we're trying to do that. And really go from column rides with one or two vehicles to call to a, a broader column ride with more of about four to six vehicles. Um, so Phil, uh, you and I have been in discussions with uh, someone who uh, are pretty profoundly disabled older adults who um, had been using VIA because that's what Medicare, Medicaid paid for um, and uh, was being turned away or being kept on the phone for an hour or things like that and she switched over to FlexRide and has had no problems since. I think Did, she was here with Accessoride and not FlexRide. I don't know. I don't know because I don't see how she would ever have gotten down to Denver to sign up for Accessible. Oh, so okay. I think she, okay. and she insists she was using VIA. Okay. So I think it was from VIA, because she certainly qualifies for that as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I still am interested in, in knowing what, what effective service levels we're getting out of those. Mm -hmm. and, if, and specifically on this, on the microtransit plan, um, whether there will be some sort of qualification where uh, people who are disabled enough don't have to make it to a block away where right. it can be picked right. up at exactly. the door. Yeah, and that's something we can work into our contract with our microtransit company. So the people using these services have to call each of the individual services to get things scheduled and <clears throat> to find out more information. I mean, what makes it easy for somebody that has some kind of cognitive issues to use these services? Right, I mean, what we're trying to do is work with a third-party provider that would allow for people with just the issues that you're talking about to be able to access the system. So we don't want it to just be a phone app or call on a phone, but we need it to be broader. We need to make sure it's also- That available. doesn't exist right now? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think it does to some extent, but um, probably not to the level and maybe Angel can talk more about that as well, but um, what we're really trying to do is work with the microtransit to be more flexible, more accessible, so that it, so anybody can use it. So, so Phil, I think you didn't maybe make the context clear. This slide is what we have now, which is a, a collection of services that do overlap in terms of who they service and, and what the different, I mean, transport doesn't overlap with anything. Right, you wouldn't call you wouldn't call them, but you would call Accessoride, Flexride, and Via. Each one of those you'd have to call kind of separately because they're all separate systems. Mm -hmm. In my mm -hmm. understanding, and nobody has to call the fixed routes or transport. Yeah, right, just all fixed the schedule routes. Fixed routes. Mm -hmm. So you may have said this, and I missed it. This uh, thing that you're proposing is strictly long run. So if I wanted to go 
somewhere other than Longmont, it would not apply. It would take you to a service that would get you on a system Got that would get it. you Got out it. of Longmont. <laughs> okay. It's confusing. It's very confusing. Um, and what we're trying I can to do... imagine how confusing it is for the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And it's not available now. Right. The, right. the new microtransaction isn't available yet. So yeah. This is what we're using to the consumer. My son uses it. Yeah. Okay. So what's the next thing we're going to do? <laughs> so we, I'll just tell you that we've, we've, we've applied for this partnership program. I talked a little bit about it. Um, it's for new and extended services. $600,000 is the max we can ask for. And this is the first year of the program. So we're trying to work with our thinking team to really get this thing off the ground for, for Longmont. So I, I have a question, because I remember seeing this when you presented to the council. The 600000 is total for the entire thing. I mean, we wouldn't get that because other places could apply for that as well. Well, it's, Is that correct? It's $2 million for the entire district. Okay. The RTD, the Regional Transportation District, which is um, in seven counties. So, um, the 600000 is Boulder well, County. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and we are competing with some other folks in Boulder County. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed that. 600, 600 for the whole project of which we are a part? Yeah. Well, just no. Boulder County will get six, we'll get okay. up to $600,000. Okay. That's the most we can get. Okay. Awesome. Okay. But um, everybody's applying for it. People are applying. A number of folks are applying for it. Yeah, we're, we're in competition with a few folks, but uh, we've, we've talked about it. We're all good. The staff all kind of gets along in Boulder County, so we've been working it out to figure out you know, where we can move the shells, you know, and get, <laughs> get the biggest thing for them. And right now, I'll be honest with you, Longmont's proposal is scoring one of the highest in the region. So um, Great. they really like the dollars that we're bringing to, mm -hmm. you know, the matching dollars that we're bringing to. Hopefully we'll keep those in the budget and we'll see what happens at about noon today. Um, so those are the things that are going on. I just, I just want to let you know too, uh, this is kind of hard to read, but uh, RTD is, is changing their fare structure for next year, which is wonderful news because we've been we've been really working to provide the ride-free bus system in Longmont, ride-free Longmont, to the local, for the locals, and we, we, we pay for that, right? It, it's, uh, it's not free, really. It's, it's free to the consumer, but it's, it costs us something. What we do is we buy up that service, and uh, it, it, it is provided free to the public. But, um, if we can eliminate some of that. And really the reason why we did that with Boulder County, uh, in partnership with Boulder County, was to prove to RTD that fares were an impediment to ridership in Longmont. And we proved it uh, a couple times over. So uh, we feel good about that. But um, just to let you know that the fares are changing. So the current fares are $3 for a local. That goes to $150 if you, if you're, if you can apply, or if you um, can get the discount fare, which anybody over 65 can do. Um, there's also a low income fare that's also available, and then there's some other discounts. Or we'll usually get the discount fare, but basically three dollars and then half of that for the, for the discount. Five twenty-five to get to the regional, like if you wanted to go to Boulder. Everything's a regional out of town, so every bus out of town is a regional except for the flex bus that's going to Fort Collins. That's not our team. But buses to Denver, buses to Boulder would count as that five twenty-five or two sixty if you get the discount, and then ten fifty or five twenty-five to get to the airport. <coughs> So under RTD's proposal, it's kind of this next four, the youth under 19 would be free for 23 and 24. So that would, they're going to try that out and see how that works. Uh, that'll start with the school year, so that's great. So we'll start mm -hmm. in late August here. We'll start seeing those free fares. And we already, you know, the local buses are already free, so I'm not sure. We're trying to figure out how this is going to affect the students uh, maybe coming from outside, you know, from Boulder or Denver, but that would be, that would be uh, the reduction in fares also uh, 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 for anybody else riding would be uh, 275 for a typical local bus, but that also counts for regionals now. So under the new system, it would be locals and regionals would all be one price. Do you and mean then, Denver? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So and then 550 would get you an all day pass. Uh, Ten dollars gets you to the airport, mm -hmm. and you could get an eighty-eight dollar per month pass. And that would cover all of the services, including the, the airport service. So mm -hmm. if you, if anybody bought that eighty-eight dollar pass, um, you could get anywhere in the in, in the RTD system for that for that price per month. 
low income, 65 people 65 uh, and over, people with disabilities, it would be a dollar 35 for that same trip anywhere in the system, or 270 for an all-day pass, and then $27 a month for the future of the trip. So we want to get it all the same. Yeah. So our team has really come to the table, really seen or really listened to folks about this because we talked about the accessibility to, to just the, all the different pieces of the system. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there was all different fare structures to the system. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would just pay what they thought was the right fare, but they probably could have saved at least half of that very typically because people getting on the bus didn't know that they qualified for a lot of discounts. And they didn't know where they were going either. I mean, if, and if you take the right free long run bus, you can actually get a transfer and transfer to the regional and pay a discounted fare, that's all going away. So that'll be nice. And then excess arrive is 450 or 225. And that only, the 225 only applies to low income. 450 is for everybody else. So that's the only discount that applies to excess arrive. And excess arrive is essentially, I'm sorry, no, is a SAT, is, is like a taxi, it comes to your door. Yes, door through door service is that one. They mm -hmm. actually help you. Oh no. It's door to door. Door to door, okay. Yeah. This, this is not really, um, Pertinent to this, but as RTD, we're going to get the um, in the bus for one more day. We are Direct. working with them to try to get that back. We've heard rumors that yes, it's coming back okay. um, maybe in January. So. Thank you. And on their web on their website, <laughs> can I see all these options? Yes. But what they'll do is they'll show you this fare structure right now. You kind of have to find what the new, there's a new fare kind of link that takes you to all the things that have been discussed and what's coming in 2024, but they, so they don't I, want to put that up front yet because it's not accurate. So, so, so if someone wanted to go to Denver from Longmont, you could go online at RTD and they give you the options? They would tell you, how, yeah, how you could do it. Um, you can also just type in kind of where you're going from and to, and they'll provide the bus options to go from here. Or, or call if you don't have a computer. Right. Okay. Uh, what what's the what's the goal here? Is the goal uh, to have uh, transportation available to anybody who that needs it, you know, including seniors, low income, uh, disabled, that sort of thing. So that's it. It's it's about long well, taking control of the services that are local to us. We know, we know about the local system, right? And we've turned it over to Denver, for folks in Denver to, to run the buses. And what we keep on hearing is, buses don't go where I want to go, when I want to go, and as often as I want to go. Mm -hmm. So to eliminate some of that pressure, we're looking at this microtransit to help solve. So all this together, should anybody who needs a ride should be able to get it easily. Within long run. Within long run. And then that should be able to take you to, you, I mean, one of your rides could be, I want to go to Raith and Kaufman, soon to be first in Maine when, in 2025, 26, when that facility hopefully opens. And that's going to be the centralized hub where all the buses, regional buses, will, will interact with the local bus system. And, and, and right now the, that happens here in the old And company. what's the timeline on this? For the microtransit? Yes, I mean the whole package. Well, the whole package is... Uh, a work in progress. Yeah, well, we're talking about all the things that are connected here, and, and it's a great point that there's a there's a bigger package to this whole thing. But microtransit, we really want to see get off the ground early next year. Early next year. Yeah, as soon okay. as we hear back from RTD, once we hear about our budget, and the council um, hopefully sees what's in the budget and can approve those dollars to move forward, then we can start a, a contract. Yeah, I, I understand it's a work in progress. Uh, my next summer. There's so many things that are yeah. you know, that are happening with transit right now. Right. That's just amazing. And so mm -hmm. the next three years are going to be very intense as far as uh, what happens in the city to facilitate transit. Um, Arlene just made a comment that our resource people should hear this presentation. Yeah, so I'm going to see where they're at, what yeah. information they have, and see what we need to take back. Good point. And just to wrap up, I just want to make sure you heard from Angel. <laughs> so council did direct staff to pursue microtransit in Longmont at their June council meeting. It was really to go after this partnership, these partnership dollars, and they said, hey, go for the max. Go for the 600000 That's really what we need to do and show that we're uh, 
fall into this program. So we really appreciated that. Council approved that we uh, apply for that partnership program, which we did. We're currently in the queue. I told you that it's already kind of risen to the top. Out of all the programs in all of Metro Denver, um, Walmart's what, number two or three, I think, on that list. Um, and then we, we do want to bring back that idea that Ride Free Longmont might, have, it might be past its prime with the whole idea that we're changing fares in January. So I should say RTD's changing fares in January. So as, as those fares change, we think that, the, that they're more equitable for Longmont. They're not, they're, they used to be one price for the whole system. So you could ride it from basically Lakewood to Aurora for the same price you could ride from our park right here the rec center. Hmm. So for us, it was like, hey, you know, give us a discount. And they always give one month to the discount before, and then they said, well, we want to make it easier for everybody, so we're going to make everybody the same. And that's what killed our ridership at that time. And so we said, hey, to pull this back out of kind of this spiral downward that we had, we need to we need to buy a piece of it. So we're going to take another look at that. We're going to ask council to take another look at it. We've had some issues, quite frankly. I think, you know. Um, Certain people are riding the bus and they're not going to any destination. There's there's a way to figure out the bus system to make it work. We, we say you can't ride all the way to the end. If you ride all the way to the end, the bus driver is supposed to kind of kick you out. And then you're supposed to have a destination on the fixed route buses. But sometimes people have figured out how to cross over and get onto buses and basically take the bus all day long. Um, and it's certainly a need that we need to consider, but I don't think the buses are the appropriate tool to, to accommodate those so and I'm going really to try to say that to council as well and ask them if that's true as well well I was going to say isn't that one of the rationales for um, for the, the free free August fares is to let people get out of the heat by riding a bus mm -hmm. no the rationale for that was really to reduce pollution because this is our highest ozone season it is July and August so the idea is come take the bus for free see how well it works <coughs> during these high ozone times, get out of your car. But mm. that was the fear. That work. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the fear. So we do have a downtown shuttle opportunity. We've been looking at um, ways to kind of get this microtransit to provide a shuttle in downtown. Uh, we think we can do this actually before the microtransit starts to take off. So um, LDBA is gonna survey their businesses, um, give some incentives to employees and to turn in routes and stops and this should help us kind of the construction of the new hotel and Kaufman, which is coming next year. And so get ready for fun uh, construction cone zones downtown all year round. Are you talking about that TT? Yeah. Okay. That's going to take some parking. Uh, Kaufman's no, going to take some parking. That's not. Oh, oh you said Kim Barton. Kaufman. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So the hotel yeah. on Kim Barton Third, uh, Kaufman Street, different blocks at different times of the year are going to be shut down to rebuild. Uh, so I can talk to you more about that at a later meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for your time. And I'll, I'll let Angel uh, speak a little bit about what Boulder County is doing to provide services. Thank you. Uh, thank you. stick around a little bit. Absolutely. Thank okay. Thanks, Phil. Good job, Phil. So I'm going to pass my cards around. I did not um, create a presentation, but um, we work really closely with the City of Longmont Transportation staff. I'm the Mobility for All program manager, and Mobility for All is a bridge program between transportation planning and the human services. So we do a lot of different things, but primarily we focus on transportation access for people with all ages and abilities. So a lot of the questions that you all were asking were definitely like piquing my interest. Um, so our foundational document is the Mobility and Access for All Ages and Abilities plan. So that's kind of where we get our direction. We that was adopted last year by the Boulder County Commissioners, and that really provides us our policy document um, to know like what to what funding to seek and what programs to invest in. So we do a bunch of different things, but one is we foster um, collaboration between the human services and transportation. So our primary mechanism for this is the um, Mobility and Access Coalition. So we host that monthly. It's a forum for nonprofits for. Um, senior centers, it's for transportation planners, the providers, to come together. We listen to different presentations, but really we're looking at transportation from a human, human centered lens. So we look um, for older adults, people with disabilities, youth, low-income households, 
and we really try to find out what the needs are. From that particular coalition, we've had a couple of projects that we've um, invested time in. One would be like the Ride Free Lafayette system, which was um, in Lafayette, obviously, but it basically was a demand responsive system similar to what Phil's proposing here in, um, in Longmont. But also one would be Accessorize. So we've been working with RTD uh, for quite a while to try to get certification to be easier. Mm -hmm. Or it's not necessarily easier to certify, but the process to be a little bit more transparent. So uh, about two years ago, RTD put in their next call for projects the option of having multiple site locations for certification. And so right now we're exploring an option with the Center for People with Disabilities to see if we can bring RTD's accessorized certification to Boulder County. Um, in particular, we're looking at the um, Center for People with Disabilities location in Boulder. But we can, if we can do proof of concept to say that it works, then perhaps we can explore other locations. And just, you, you were right, for Accessoride, it is a barrier. Um, a lot of times it's a perceived barrier. People don't want to go to Denver to get certified. It used to be Lakewood that they had to go to. But um, RTD does pay for people to go. They have a vehicle, they set up the appointment, mm -hmm. and they get a free trip to go to the certification center. Mm -hmm. And but, but if you have a respirator and you have to run batteries in them, yeah. you can't do it from here because your battery runs out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we are working on that. There's certain regulations around. Um, so Accessoride is a civil rights service, right? So there's it's regulated at the federal level with the Federal Transit Administration, and there's certain things that transit agencies have to do, and that's that three quarters of a mile buffer around fixed route. But um, we do have a Transportation Options 101 presentation that we've given to different nonprofits, which I think, Ronnie, maybe we could schedule with staff here. And we don't just focus on the transit options, but we really do get into depth, like how to like, access all of them. Um, one thing that we do also focus on with Mobility Borough is education and outreach. So we actually work with the Senior Center to get workshops in the catalog. Uh, we weren't able to get any in the fall catalog because I think you all have some turnover of whoever's like putting together the catalog. But we recently did a travel training, which is basically teaching people how to ride the bus. We did a Ben and Jerry's travel training. A bilingual group um, left here from the senior center and went to Boulder on the Bolt, and they got ice cream as part of it. So it was kind of a fun trip that we did um, earlier this summer. But we've also done the Mobility Options 101 training here at the Senior Center, how to use Uber, how to use Lyft. And a lot of those, we have um, volunteers who help us connect with uh, older adults in the community. And a lot of our volunteers are older adults themselves or have people with disabilities, or are, they have disabilities themselves. So we really do um, work with the Senior Center and then also the City of Boulder, uh, or City of Longmont, sorry, <laughs> City of Longmont, all of the cities across Boulder County to try to make sure that people have access to services and education. Um, as Phil was talking about the Sub-Regional Service Council for RTD, um, we are gonna be deciding tomorrow like um, what projects get funded. So I represent the Mobility and Access Coalition on that Sub-Regional Council. So I'm supposed to be voicing the opinion of people who are underserved, so older adults, people with disabilities, long-term households, and so I will be um, on that selection committee for the entire region, and we'll know um, probably by the end of the week, I don't know if they're going to announce it, but like which projects get selected. Um, as Phil was talking about, we are really collaborative in Boulder County, I think more so than other sub-regional areas, so we do like, keep each other in the loop on a lot of these things. Um, I don't know if you have any, as far as Right Free Longmont goes, like um, going away, we probably should talk about. Oh, absolutely, it's going to take a lot of yeah. discussion, it's not going to just happen. Yeah. So we, um, Tennessee, how the microtransit yeah. kind of takes hold, and if it's you know okay. if it's successful, yeah, uh, we don't want to just. The council is pretty clear; they don't want to get rid of it, but yeah. we do want to talk about it because it some of those costless now. Yes, yeah. a little costless. Yeah, which is great. Yeah, and we definitely um, so mobility for all we oversee some transportation supports for Boulder County Housing Authority as well. So there's the spoke on Kaufman, and we provide some transportation programming there, like earn a bike workshops. Um, and then also an EcoPass program where anybody who lives at a Boulder County Housing Authority site can get a free EcoPass. So there's lots of changes because we don't know how much our EcoPass contract is going to be next year either because of the changing fares. But on the whole, Phil presented the uh, fares. It's 
great news, $27 for a month for an older adult, somebody with a disability or low income is just a huge win. Mm -hmm. And um, Mobility for All, we do try to incentivize people to sign up for the low income pass program. Um, another big win is for people with disabilities being able to get the low income pass on Accessoride because that was not the case. If you got one discount, then that's all you got under the current care structure. But in the future, that discount on Accessoride is going to be huge for people with disabilities. But um, this is just kind of an overview. I don't know what questions you all have. I know that you were talking about various things with. Um, I think I addressed most of the questions that came up when you all were talking. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So in the past, there also used to be a special discount card. Mm -hmm. Is that still a thing? It is a thing. So the special discount card, that is for people who um, could qualify for the disability discount or the older adult discount. If you had another state ID that showed that you were over 65, you wouldn't need it, right? But if it was kind of ambiguous if you were over 65 or not and you didn't have a state ID, then you were encouraged to go to um, apply for a special discount card online. And that can be challenging. We yeah, do. They used to have someone come here. Yeah. Like years and years ago. So I didn't know if that was part of what you're talking about with Accessorite and the discount card or if they're like separate. Yeah. Okay. They're separate, but Mobility for All, we do have people who help people one on one and we could help somebody like up, um, submit it online, right? And, I think RTD, they've moved online for most of their applications for the special discount cards, which we know is a barrier for people, um, but we can help people. Um, I don't know if this has access to the internet, but you could search maybe Boulder County Mobility Options um, online, but we do have a web page. It's, we, we're updating it right now, but it does have a list of all the mobility options in Boulder County because it is a lot to navigate. We also have a button on that page where you can do a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a mobility <coughs> specialist. We try to do those virtually, like maybe through Zoom or on a phone call first, and then if somebody needs a little bit more assistance, then we can meet them in the community potentially. Um, yeah, but um, it really does have, it's called, it's we are what's called a mobility management type of a program, which means it's human-centered, customer-centered, and it's really trying to find the best option for whoever, um, this one is the Mobility and Access for All Ages and Abilities Plan. You want to go scroll down a little bit? Um, just go back up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like doing it backwards. And <laughs> okay, let's see what this one is Mobility for All. So this is, we're cleaning this up a little bit so it's a little bit less text. But down here we have mobility options by type, but we have it down here by city. So you can click on Longmont and it's an accordion um, that talks about supports that we have for each of these modes of transportation and which options are available currently. Um, and then we, um, we also have like some more like expensive routes, right? Uh, but you can click on each of these and it would it um, opens up the information up here. Um, still pretty like that one. So it opens up to that um, mode of transportation that you just mm -hmm. clicked on. So it is a little bit, I mean, it's overwhelming for some people, but if you click right here, book an appointment with the Mobility for All Mobility Specialist, we can um, we can set up a time, to 30 minute time to meet with people and help um, make sure that it's an individualized approach. We do have like an individual mobility plan that we can help somebody develop. Um, and then also we just, we partner with some community centers and senior centers to like do training to help people learn how to like plan their own trips. Great. I don't know whether this is an appropriate question, yeah. but if I have my um, RTD card, yeah. years on the top, will I have to re, um, reapply with the new fares, or do they automatically you have the special, You have the special discount card? Yeah. Yeah, you should be fine. Yeah, you should be able to keep it, yeah. And you'll just get a better a better price. They are yeah. pushing towards using the MyRide app, which is the phone-based app, 
And that's one of the reasons why we developed a workshop series on how to use apps, because a lot of the transit agencies are pushing towards that app phase. Um, so what's good about the new system, and then we can also do a workshop or talk to you all about how to set up my ride. You have a card that you can get, it's linked to an app, but what's great about it is they do fare capping now. So their system is like if you pay that dollar fifty when they institute the new fares in July or January, once they tap it like dollar fifty dollar fifty, once you if you're an older adult once you hit that um, twenty seven dollars you wouldn't have to pay anything after that, yeah. right? So it's good because a lot of especially for low income folks a lot of the barrier is it, um, it's hard to have that money up front to be able to pay for like a monthly pass where you get a cheaper discount, but that fare capping hopefully will be really good for everybody you don't have to like do the math it will just calculate when you reach that monthly pass Thanks. maybe covered this already this mm -hmm. for a second but you know this is really great stuff i wasn't aware of part of it yeah. of it. um most of the people around this table are probably pretty computer literate mm -hmm. yeah uh, there's a lot of people that aren't yeah. and uh, you, you, know, you, you get over 80 yeah. And there's a lot of people, like my father in law, used to take the yeah. computer and throw it across the room because he couldn't, because he couldn't function. Yeah. With these things. So, is there an alternative? There is. I mean, it's not necessarily an alternative, but we have a technology ambassador program. Um, let's see if this opens up. Um, so, basically, we have a group of volunteers who are themselves older adults or people with disabilities. And then we have five workshops that talk about how to use different apps, right? So um, the apps that we do trainings on are the Transit app, which if you're using Transit, that's a pretty um, user-friendly version. There's also the RT Mobile Ticketing app that we focus on, which is the MyRide. Um, so if you want to purchase a bus pass, there's Uber, there's Lyft, and then there's Google Maps. So we teach people how to access those five, and we can provide one-on-one -on -one support. We host workshops um, on how to access those apps if people have smartphones. But we have to acknowledge that a lot of people won't have a smartphone or that they can't use it. And so that's why we will hopefully be able to refer them to somebody who can have a phone, right? Like they can touch on their phone. So yeah. I'm just saying that needs to be an easy process. Yeah, it is. Well, and what we found, because we've done a couple of pilots, we did a lift pilot at one of the housing authority sites in Lafayette, where um, we were giving anybody who was at the housing authority site $50 a month to use on Lyft. And there was a lot of resistance at first, but we trained six different ambassadors who were volunteers who got compensated with a few extra credits to use Lyft. And once people try it once or twice, like mm -hmm. even like pretty limited tech savvy people can learn how to use it because it's pretty intuitive, right? They just open up the app and say, like, I want to go to this address and then click the button, right? So I think at that point we found that the financial payment was the biggest barrier, not necessarily the technology, but really it's getting people over that first hump to like start and like try something and get out of their bubble because that's just really hard and intimidating. But um, yeah, so we do to help teach people who have smartphones how to use other mobile options or how to access information. Okay. <coughs> Questions? So I have a question about the vans. Mm -hmm. And did, uh, did you say that there are four to six passenger vans for the... Um, That's the plan. Okay. So tell me where the people access the ability to get on and off the van um, and also where the wheelchair is going to go. If you do a disability, yeah, each of the vans should be van accessible. That will be part of our contract that we write. Is it back or side? We don't know because we don't know yet who the contract will be with. <laughs> so, I would imagine side. Um, that's fairly typical for for these kind of smaller vans, but we don't know yet. So, if I'm accessing it and I'm getting on, I'm assuming I'm getting on on the side. So am I getting on in a van where I've actually got room to <clears throat> walk between the seats or the front of the van and the seats? Or is it so pushed together that you have a real hard time getting in? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. I can't so you don't that. have any, I, I can, any I ability can, to, to... Well, we can program that. that into the contract mm -hmm. terms. Yeah. If you have a preference, if we could, you know, we'll want to talk to people as we kind of move through this and find out what they want, what, what people want. 
And so that's, those are great things to put together as far as putting together maybe a small task force as we, if we know we're gonna, gonna get the money in 2024, let's put together a task force and start talking about what the needs are for people. I, yeah, I would say that like there's a lot of transportation regulations of what meets accessibility standards, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. and it has a lot to do with the spacing of the um, of the seats. And when you're using public dollars, you have to meet those accessibility standards. If it's like a senior facility that's buying it with their own money, they don't necessarily have to have like spaced out seats with room for a uh, um, wheelchair to maneuver. But for using any public dollars, you have to be able to have room for the wheelchair to be able to pull into the spot and be secured by the driver. Mm -hmm. And there's certain there's certain standards with like driver training and what they like the level of assistance right. that they have to provide. And I know that we talked a little bit about door to door, door through door, right? So um, generally speaking, somebody like Via, who is a nonprofit, they go above and beyond the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, right? As far as like going through the door, right? They'll help people carry their groceries in, right? They go door through door to help people. They would help people put their coats on. That's not required by the ADA, right? The ADA is, it requires your base level to be curb to curb. Mm -hmm. And if you have a disability that prohibits you to get to the door, then you do a modification for a disability to go door to door. But the base level is gonna be curb to curb for any transit service. Um, and so for something like this, um, if there is a drop-off point, kind of like a, a modified fixed route where you have like a drop-off point that's on the corner, like you would write into your contract that they would have to take into consideration disabilities and they would go curb to curb for somebody with a disability or something like that. So you would just do one step above, like if it's, if for the general public, you're expecting people to walk from the intersection to their curb, then for people with disabilities, you would have that vehicle go to their curb, right? So it's just one step above. If it's a curb to curb for everybody, then for people with disabilities, you have to go to the door, right? So it's just, um, it's regulated a lot more closely than what I think. Um, so currently right now, we, we work with VIA and mm -hmm. provide shopping yeah. vans for the people at the housing authorities. Yeah. And the thing with the van, it's actually, it's a bus. Yeah. It had, the steps are not right. Um, which I really think that they're not legal because they're probably at least about this tall, yeah. which is really hard for the people to get in. And then the minute you get up to the top, it immediately turns and there's another step. Yeah. So I mean, so how do you de how do you deal with that? Because it's got to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure which bus it is, if it's a body on chassis or if it's um, one of their MV ones or whatever, but. Um, the alternative is probably using the lift, right? So if somebody can't like, get up and make that turn, then the driver is supposed to allow people, even if they don't have a wheelchair, to use the lift to get up to the level and do a um, straight boarding. And they do that, but they yeah. can, the majority of them can do that. It's just yeah. that it's extremely awkward mm -hmm. the way that it, it works. I ride yeah. that thing every time I go out yeah. shopping with them. So it's just, that's, those are the kind of things that really kind of, after mm -hmm. the fact, you can't do anything so yeah. yeah yeah and i think that it also has to do with like cdl licensing and like what level of vehicle because those vehicles that you're talking about they're on like a regular truck chassis and then mm -hmm. they just put the bus on top of it mm -hmm. so really that base is a truck right. so that you don't have to have a cdl license um anything bigger than that truck you have to have a cdl license mm -hmm. so that's probably and i'll you can research this offline i know that I think we're out of time, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Actually, you didn't. Okay. Uh, you know, well, I'd be glad to come back and talk. I have the transportation. I was going to ask one. both of you if you consider coming back at a later yeah. time, because I'm sure we're going to have some more questions again. Yeah. So, yeah. More yeah. Updates. Yeah. We're going to find yeah. out if we got the money. Yeah. Right. Yeah, definitely. Right. And then also, Ronnie, I mean, I know you're on our distribution list for the Mobility and Access Coalition, um, but like, just all of you are open. You're welcome to join that um, discussion. Um, it's open to the public. It's the second Monday of the month at 2 p.m. It's 2 to 3.30. And that's where we do a lot of these discussions around what priorities as a region we want to have. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yes. the invitation. Thank you. And you did ask for the presentation. Yes. Uh, thank you. Okay. Have to share out.
Let me uh, print it as a PDF so it looks a little better. But you never know what you're going to get, it, so I'll, I'll print that out for you and send it. And I'll distribute it to everybody. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right. Thank you. You must be from the city. City marketing. Hi, my name is Becky Doyle. This is the you know, first time I've been with this body. I'm the director of strategic integration, which is, you know, <laughs> sounds very right. So what we do is we help all the services across the city. This is for the city. This is for the city, yes. Um, with the city of Longmont. So what we do is we help all the different services across the city incorporate um, some of our, our kind of overarching goals. So, you know, using data, using GIS systems to, to make maps, um, you know, incorporating sustainability concepts into their work. And so a lot of those things are sort of overarching, but, uh, you know, sometimes folks um, need, need a little help to, to figure out how to bring those into our operations. So that's what we do. Um, so I'm here because we've been working with Ronnie on uh, on the survey, and I think we need we need some help from you. So, um, uh, Ronnie, do you want to say anything about that, or should I? Yeah, no. Well, <laughs> what about the survey, the, the need or the yeah, thank you. So, well, kind of go. I'll take a few steps back. So, you know, the the, the data we've been collecting, been collecting since I've been here, uh, worked with the advisory board to identify many things, right? Our building needs. Uh, the rate in which we're programming, the community growth, um, a lot of a lot of these things, and so we've collected a lot of good data since uh, since I've been here, and it just keeps evolving. We keep finding some some things, and I'm like, okay, well, let's start unpacking that. We get an answer to that. Oh, well, let's let's look deeper and let's unpack that. Mm -hmm. And so where we're at right now is just taking a look at who, um, who 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 we're serving for our programs, right? So. The age groups. So we did three different age groups, 55 to 65, uh, um, right? 55 to 65, 66 to uh, 76, and then 86, right? Seventy-six. Seven. Yeah. Sorry, I can't count today. <laughs> we and so yeah, so we just grouped them together just to see who 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 is registering for our programs. And um, I meant to bring that data, and I did not bring it here today. So I'll, I'll, I can present this at our, our next board meeting, and I can even send them out before then, just so you have it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the rate, the groups that we're really serving is that sixty-six and older group, mm -hmm. right? So we're starting to look just, I mean, huge difference. I'm talking about, I think annually it was like um, that fifty, that sixty-six to seventy-six group was like fifteen thousand, over fifteen thousand people registering for our programs. And then looking at the 55 to 65, it was like, um, maybe like 1,300, something very, very small. So we were just kind of want to explore that and start unpacking that as to, well, let's, you know, wondering why we're only getting such a minimal uh, part uh, enrollment in our programs from, from this age group. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what we're that's mm -hmm. well, that's, because that's, they're working. That's our idea, right? That's, yeah. that's 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 the quick response. Mm -hmm. And so what we really want to do is start unpacking that. Is it is that one reason? Is another layer? Um, they're not ready to uh, commit to being in an older adult, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is it that the programs yeah. offered um, <laughs> um, are, are not meeting their interests or their needs? Mm -hmm. So we just, again just want to start unpacking that as to the whys. And so, with that, um, we working with Becky and our team is to start generating um, a list of questions to unpack the why and, and administer a, a, a community survey, not just a senior center survey, but amongst the local community as a whole. So, last time we did our customer service survey, it was just directed to our to our senior center, in which we received I can't even remember what to guess, but a lot of a lot. I think it was over. I don't know. Uh, we, we, we generate a lot of responses from uh, both in person and electronic mm -hmm. submissions. And so now we're just looking at a greater level again, surveying the whole community, not just our senior center participants, not those 
1,300 individuals for, you know, who, who participate in the program for the year, we want to survey the whole, the whole community. Yeah, because it's definitely important to understand for folks who are coming to the senior center, why are they coming, you know, um, what, what would they also be interested in seeing, and what are some of the barriers that we can help them overcome? You know, like transportation may be a barrier for some, as we were just learning. Um, so so that's, those are some of the questions that we want to ask. Um, but yeah, exactly, Ronnie's exactly right. We also need to figure out for those who are not coming to the senior center who aren't participating in programs, what are some of the reasons for that? And are those things that we You might have to start at the beginning with me. But <laughs> what, um, how do you collect your information? What I'm, what I'm getting at is uh, Ronnie was just talking about a lot of data that has been collected. Mm -hmm. yeah. One problem, and I think everybody would acknowledge that, is pretty much based on the existing population. You ask the people that come in the doors, and the only information you get is from those people that, that, mm -hmm. that, that are familiar with the senior center, right? Yes. So how do you go about collecting information you know, to those elements of the community that aren't being served right now? How do you do that? So what we're proposing is uh, to use three collection methods for this survey. So one of which is, mm -hmm. is you know, intercepts. So as folks come in the door, we ask them some of these questions about like, why are we here today? Um, one would be an online survey, so anyone with you know the access to it could, could fill it out online. But because we know that there are you know varying levels of comfort with technology, um, we are also proposing to mail a survey with a paper um, return, or someone could fill it out online. So that's that's what we're looking for. Um, as far as the information that we already have, Ronnie's done a really great work, um, you know, collecting information from registration for programs where program registration is required, and that's where we kind of noticed that anomaly as far as um, age group and attendance. So, how, okay, I, I think I understand that. Um, how do you how do you ensure that you tapped into some element or some segments, for example, again the same ones we've been talking about, you know that. Older and disabled or low income, how, how do you know you've got them represented? In so, usually, what we would do is we would ask a couple of those demographic questions. So, we'll probably ask, we'll certainly ask about age brackets since that's what we're most interested in. We do have a question about barriers where people can self identify as having, you know, mobility issues or, or other um, uh, potential ability uh, challenges that, that keep them from coming. We could ask other demographic questions, and then we compare that to census information and see if our responses and the, the distribution across those different, um, you know, demographic characteristics like age, do, did we get kind of the same representation from that age group as we would expect in the population based on what we know from the census? Is this an ongoing thing, or is this something that could do again next year, for example? If we find it useful, it be, right? <laughs> it's a new thing. Yeah. Is that the plan? I mean, I, 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 I think we're just taking it one step at a time, at a time to where whatever information we collect brings up good questions as to like, oh, hey, let's let's start exploring that to see why this is the way it is, mm -hmm. and um, so could it continue? Uh, possibly, mm -hmm. depending on where we want it to go and what information. Collected and what answers we want to gain from from that. The city also has a practice of a, a biannual customer satisfaction survey, which is usually a, a mailed and online survey. And so, what we might do is, if we find we want to track things over time, we might include some questions in that survey, just so we have that because that really is a statistically validated that everything is is weighted to match those those census parameters. Um, so that might be something if we if we flag a, an issue that we that we want to see over time. And you mentioned um, 55 to 65, 65, 66, 76, but what about 76 to 87? Could you really give us an idea on that? Yeah. I'm curious as to what it compares to the 13,000 for the mm -hmm. 66 to 76. The 13, was 13,000 the total? Oh, Let's see. Bracket. So it was for the bracket of sixty-six to seventy-six, yeah. And then thirteen hundred was a fifty-five to sixty-five. So we had three age groups: uh, fifty-five to sixty-five, sixty-six to seventy-six, and seventy-seven to eighty-seven. 
And with that, I think collected from 2019 to 2023. So current at that time when I pulled this information uh, for the 77 to 87 year old bracket, uh, 13,554 participants registered for our programs. The 66 to 76, 16,432 participants. And then the 55 to 65 age group, only 3,401 participants. So that's three different kinds of numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those aren't the same numbers. Yeah, those are the same numbers. So I was way up. Yeah, like I said, I, uh, don't quote me on those. I was just going to tell you. It's a very striking bar. But it's, it's, yeah. it's just it's a big disparity, yeah. right? Big difference right. in participation. It's, that, uh, it's still low. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah. it's about the 65 to yeah. so That's almost 30,000 participants from the 66 to 87 year olds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then only mm -hmm. 3,400. So um, should for you the your, should your third bracket go be should be and up rather than two eighty seven because I'm pretty sure we don't absolutely top out there we must oh, have some people in their nineties we don't but we did notice a tapering off and so um, again the, the, so that we we group those ages yes but after eighty seven it kind of started tapering off for you know, different reasons and we just wanted to capture those numbers, those mm -hmm. those three age groups. Should we go beyond that? Sure. Um, but then the, again, data collection just keeps going and going and going. So. And this data only comes from people who registered and gave yeah, us an accurate yeah. birth date in the system. Mm -hmm. So we have so many programs here that we don't register for at all. So like, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they're not coming. It's just not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you ensure that people are not taking more than one survey so that they pack a certain thing to go their way. Mm -hmm. um, in, in this case, there, that would potentially occur, um, but again, since we're kind of comparing it against the, the expected population amounts, we're not overly concerned about it. If in the future we were to use one of the statistically validated surveys, they have, you know, like one time use, like specific codes um, so that there aren't those duplications. This one's slightly less formal, um, you know, just to help us get an idea of where to, where to start. So that, that is a possibility. Okay. We could do some IT monitoring. <laughs> it's a concern. Gosh, a lot of people are taking this out to see this. Any questions? I think we may also be looking for Help. Yeah, so volunteers. <laughs> so, uh, for our for our in-house surveys. Um, so, kind of like we did with our customer service um, surveys, we did have the same approach of identifying busy time only only for one week. So, for five days, identifying the busy times out of each day, and um, trying to see if we could pull together some volunteers to catch people coming out of classes to see if they would be willing to answer. And I think it's like an eight-question survey. Mm -hmm. um, you can put me on the list. You can put me on the list. Too. Perfect. And so I have um, Bianca working on working on that. So she said she's going to bring it here shortly to kind of identify those busy times for each day to see if anybody would be willing to sign up for mm -hmm. those specific times. Mm -hmm. And whatever <laughs> holes there are, I'll, I'll reach out to our volunteers to see if anybody can kind of help fill in those spaces as well. So. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your interest in the help and the so well, thank you. I want to thank do, you I for do, your information. I do want to point out like this this group is very data driven, which I very much appreciate as well. And it helps tell our story, right? Identify what our needs are, how to best service our, our community, our customers, um, and how to better program, right? And um, Becky and her team has done a really good job kind of breaking all out of this information down and raising new questions and bringing new ideas to the table with okay, well. But what other sources of information can we, or, or resources can we pull together to um, generate more, more data, more information? So, Ben has done done a great job, um, which I appreciate is how helping drive this work. And again, a big focus of our our board. Actually, I didn't want to interrupt you, but that that goes for us. <laughs> the question: What about peak mitigation? Are we going through? Not speaking, getting to be a real issue. 
it is getting to be a real issue. So um, we recently um, completed a heat mapping exercise where we had volunteers oh, that Zach, Zach. Zach. Yep, yep, Zach led that effort. So that that information was collected a week and a half ago or so, a couple weeks ago, um, on a nice hot day at, at a few points in time in various locations throughout the city. So um, all of the, the data collected through that exercise is currently being analyzed. And then uh, we'll go through an exercise where we'll, where we'll talk to the community about, you know, what, what are you doing, um, you know, to, to, to mitigate heat? You know, what are some steps that the city can take that are kind of those community solutions for, um, for addressing heat? I know this is a passionate topic of Marcia's as well. <laughs> so that, that's absolutely something that we're, we're looking at um, exploring and, and you know, funding in some different ways. We look like you're anxious to say something. <laughs> Me? No, no, no. I, I sit the Sustainability Advisory Board on, on suggestions for heat mitigation mm -hmm. needs on the city, so they may be re re returning a, a, a report, you know, similar to the Beneficial Electrification Report, only smaller. <laughs> but, you know, I have plenty of good things to say about that. <laughs> so yeah, we, we expect actual projects to probably be funded and to be occurring in 2025 and later. So we'll kind of figure out what's what's the plan, to, you know, through the next six months or so, and then uh, conclude those things in the following budget. Um, the reason I asked uh, if this was going to be an ongoing thing, like we can do it next year. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd like to see is that we take the as a group, as a board, you take the various areas, like transportation, for example, mm -hmm. and as a board, uh, come to some recommendations that we would give to the city council on things that we think are important that, and that they should consider doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then along with that, some benchmarks. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, but we don't have, as a board, we certainly don't have the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. And you have limited staff, I'd like you to do it. So I'm, I'm just wondering if if we, in, in our recommendations, we have some sort of goals or benchmarks. <laughs> Could you then follow up on that to see how we're doing? Absolutely. Yes, I think that's something that we can, we can work through. And that. actually, I, I can say that for almost any area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can talk about, you know, what, what we think are going to be good, good indicators to follow and, you know, a lot of, we have a lot of information. As, as yeah, a city, yeah, we, have, yeah. we know all kinds of things, and so yeah, that's something we can uh, uh -huh. we can put together. And, uh, how big are staff here? How big are offices? Are well, so the office of data and analytics currently is is, is, is three people. Um, so there's that, but then you know we also have the sustainability, and a lot of I think these things are going to fall kind of in that sustainability realm. There's a lot of reporting that happens in that area. Um, but the, and then we have you know GIS staff. We're looking at kind of the geographic components of it. So all together, we're about forty mm -hmm. um, so across you know all kinds of disciplines. So yeah. Impressive. <laughs> Any other questions? It was great right. to meet you thank all. you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much. I look we'll forward have, to our partnerships. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll have you back. Okay. Great. Back to whole business. Is that okay? Yeah. How about vacancy yeah. updates? We'll jump in there. So uh, we conducted interviews over the past couple of weeks uh, for our vacant recreation program coordinator and our recreation program supervisor positions. Um, very great. It's just very grateful. I'd say on average twenty, uh, on average about twenty applicants each month. Various experiences, um, but we were able to pull out. The, the most qualified individuals for interviews. And um, we made offers. So we made an offer for uh, each position and we have our recreation program coordinator <coughs> starting next Monday. Uh, the, the 21st is next Monday, or no, not the 21st, 
there's 14 of them. Let me see this. Right. 14. Double check. 21st, though. Uh, sorry, the 21st. Starting the 21st. And. Um, That's Rodriguez? Yes. That is Valerie Rodriguez. And she is coming to us with 18 years total experience, um, 15 specific years experience with the city of Commerce, with Commerce City, and uh, it, with senior programming. And three years on top of that for, for event planning for the city of Brighton. So she's got plenty of experience. She's excited to join our team. And uh, you know, she's just very passionate about supporting uh, our own adult community, and she's just she's gonna be great. Uh, so excited to have her join our team, and then a Amy Amy Hodge will be joining us the week after the twenty eighth, and she's coming from the, the town of Eaton, and she has ten years of experience in, in older adult programming and, and supervisor experience collectively. So uh, excited to have her. She's very excited to join our team as well. And so those are filling the last two vacant positions we have on our team. Good job. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You're so it's been a nice help to you. Huh? Yeah. Get that going. Mm -hmm. That's so, fast work in this job market. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It must be changing. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. I've heard. Yeah. And so, you know, what I'm excited is, of course, not only did we get these positions Fields, positions filled, we got them filled with qualified people who were just filling a hole, right? Mm -hmm. And I made that very clear that we were going to be very intentional with our hiring process. As much as we want to get these positions filled immediately, we want the right person. And these two individuals, um, you know, from what we've seen um, in the hiring team, we've seen they're just not only going to be a great support and a great fit to uh, our staff, each other. But for our community as well. So uh, again, being intentional with the hiring process of getting those right people. In. So we're excited. I'm excited to have them. So yeah. did you get any applications from within the senior center or within the, the city? Within the city, we did have uh, we did have interest. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, when we were able to kind of have discussions. Uh, I can say decisions were made um, based off their own, own, their own personal needs. Um, so again, just through discussion, decided that you know it was not may not be the best fit at this time, their own personal needs. So. Does, that, does that give you a full staff right now? Yes, that would that would give us a full team. So you got this new uh, maintenance person. I think you mentioned that last time. And yes, last time. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so um, goes by Junior. Junior joined us during during our closure, and um, this is his first full week uh, here with us. <laughs> oh, it's only Wednesday, and uh, it's just <laughs> another again intentional not hiring process, finding the right people, and he's just again jumps right in and gets along with everybody, and it just. Feels like he's been here for a long time. It's already it's so like good fit, right? huh? Oh, absolutely. Great. And you know, checking with him, again, how do you feel? Do you feel supported? Do you have what you need to be successful? And I love it. Yeah. I, I love it here already. Mm -hmm. So that's what good. we want. That's yeah, what that's we want. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you say you were you would put in for a future position with the budget? I did. Yes. Okay. Um, I made two requests: one uh, for for recreation programmers uh, coordinators, and I, you know, one of them. Would focus on on um, Spanish programming. One of them was a request to partner with the LHA to get um, residents out of off the property and mm -hmm. here at the senior center, making connections, directing relations, um, engaging in our in our programs, uh, utilizing our resources, and um, an additional request for uh, I can't remember how many hours at the top of my head for part time hours, so we can try and get more staff in for facilitation. So, do we uh, do we have an LHA coordinator right now on staff? We do not. So we had a um, LHA resource specialist who Brandy supervised, okay. um, and that person 
Yeah, I see. So I'm going to email all those. And what? Yeah, what was name? That was uh, Valerie mm-hmm. Alvin Zuckers. Yeah. Okay, and I remember. Yeah. I think she came over to Village Place. Yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah. It was just a, it was just a one room gal. And we're very sad to see her leave, along with all of our other uh, you know, teammates that we've lost. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who was that that just left the room? Anybody know? That was a. Um, Somebody wanted to sit in and be a part of the oh. Oh. Sorry, I didn't catch what he was. Uh, he was just a patron of the citizens. Of oh, citizens of the a, a, member, a member of the public. Oh, yeah. yeah. I meant to ask him. I'm surprised that he, yes, he didn't want to be there. Yes, he said. Oh, you did. Somebody it. asked him if he was yeah, at the beginning of the meeting. Oh, okay. And he didn't? He didn't. Oh, okay. Hmm. All right. I just want to ask him. Well, it's okay. Right. Good job. Yeah. I've got mm-hmm. that under control. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so with that, um, you know, we just yeah, that we want to set these two individuals up for success. So we're going to evaluate our program as a whole. Um, the rate and look for programming. So we want them to come in. They have to learn our city systems, our building systems, who their resources are, who their programmers are, who their um, right, who all of these connections. Um, so not only do they have to learn all of those things, right? <laughs> they have to learn um, learn day-to-day operations, what supports they need to be available for that, focus on future programming, um, learn each other, you know, developing that chemistry with, with each other, uh, learning our, our software systems. And so there's a lot to learn quickly. And so we want to set them up for success too. We want to create that overwhelming um, that, that sense of overwhelming that we've, we've heard about, right, since I've heard about since I've been here in this position. So, uh, you know, we are, we will keep Terry Calvin, who's jumped in and helped programming um, in the departure of our last two positions, and uh, she'll be an additional resource to help, help these individuals get acclimated. Um, and Terry's willing to stay with us as long as we can keep her. <laughs> so, so we, again, we just want to provide that, that, that area of support so they don't feel overwhelmed and have that have that sense of work-life balance that we've been talking about for so long mm-hmm. and so uh, we are going to evaluate programs again getting back to data right um, what programs are we providing that that there's there, there's low enrollment what about programs that we're going to be losing money on you know things like that and we're going to make some make some cuts we're going to pull back a little bit on our programming right out the gate to allow, again, allow them the space to learn all of these things, but not feel overwhelmed with the pressure of trying to program um, 100, 100, 167 programs like we have before. Sorry, how many? 167. 167 is 170. 170 mm-hmm. So again, um, so we just want to create that space for them to feel successful, and then with we'll see what happens with these additional staffing requests. Uh, we'll see how quick it takes for them to get acclimated, and then we will build back up when we're we're ready to. So again, we just want to create that space for them to 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 feel successful right out the gate, and we don't want to create the sense of overwhelming that we we've heard. Good strategy. You know, I understand that nobody wants any of the programs cut. Yeah. Um, but if they're low enrollment right. and they're losing money, and we're in a position right now where we really have to look at that, okay. then it's not to say they're going to be cut for good. Mm-hmm. And sometimes what happens is you cut a program and all of a sudden everybody shows interest in it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, I guess we just needed to let them know we're taking it away for them to yeah. say, oh, wait, we yeah. want to keep it. Yeah. But I do yeah. understand exactly what you're talking about and trying to trim things so that, you know, everybody's only, the new people are only learning what's, you know, what's well attended and, and, uh, I don't want to make it sound like that, but the new people are learning the programs that are the most attended, mm-hmm. and uh, and then on down the line, right. you know, learning them all. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, and it allows us. I know 167 programs sounds fantastic, and that's what separates us from a lot of our. our, our I don't want to say, um, um, well, our, our community, the surrounding communities, right? Mm-hmm. It, our peers, right? And, and, and I don't want to say competitors, but right. <laughs> right? Um, and and then that that feels great, and it sounds great, and it is great, right? But it allows us to step back right now and focus on quality versus quantity, yeah. 
mm -hmm. and the qu quantity will increase once these individuals become acclimated. Um, and, and, and we see if, addition, if, if we bring an additional staff in, request approved. Thank you. Thank you. Or you can also make people have to show interest, mm -hmm. right. you know, right. and, and right. say that they're willing to yeah. attend something if, if, if it's been taken. Right. I really think that's going to be the case. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so to communicate that out, I mean, because we've seen our go cover, um, we have not, and I'll make sure we'll grab it on the way out, sharing that again here under uh, staff overhaul, and we just we need to leave the, our communities patients at this time. and. Um, and I've had so many <clears throat> conversations with uh, uh, a lot of our patrons who've had questions. They, you know, they've, they've called, they've talked to people on the phone, they've come and knocked on the door and made appointments, and providing clarity of what our plan is. Uh, of the concern, because the concern is, oh, we're not going to have programs. Well, you know, we're going to have no programs. But this is what it's going to look like, and you know, walking them through that fully understood. Like, oh, okay, well, this this makes sense. You know, the work we've done with. Um, this board, with our friends board, same thing. And I have a meeting with with our um, our trip leads, who are also very passionate about our programs. Right? Uh, next next Monday to kind of share this information. I've talked with a handful of them, but being able to talk to them, all of them collectively as a whole, of, this is what the plan is, and this is what it's going to look like to to put put their mind at ease a little bit. So those who I have talked with uh, of our trip leads. <coughs> Again, like, oh, oh yeah, this, this makes sense. This helps to set them up for success and gets us moving away from that sense of over, uh, feeling overwhelmed that, that's been in these positions historically. So uh, everybody's on board with that, and I just, we're just continuing to get that message out. And so, with this group specifically, they're great advocates in our community, they work with a lot of different groups, and they'll be able to help Hector um, get this message out to those who. What are trip leads? So that they help, uh, they help facilitate our trips. So they go on the trips. And oh, they, okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to speak for everybody. I think you have the support of the board as far as the direction you're going, uh, support the staff, and maybe make it easier for them to succeed. And part of that is probably reprioritizing some of the things that are done here. I mean, we've seen the change. We want to provide programs, but maybe it can't be the same as it was before. So, do I mm -hmm. speak for everybody? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Change is hard for a lot of people, it but is. change is inevitable. I think, that's, exactly. I think that's there's a real easy. struggle there, and yet it is inevitable. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I think too. I'm sorry. I no, go ahead. Go ahead. I think too that. Um, I hate it when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll go back to it again. Well, I, I'll say that I felt <laughs> nothing but that support from, from this group uh, from since day one. And I, and I really appreciate that. And then, you know, again, the conversations we have, the, the, the feedback and direction and suggestions that's been provided from this board has helped, helped, helped guide, guide not only this work, but again, the, this, this goal uh, that we have for, for our team. Yeah, we, we got more. Yeah. Any more. I um, think too. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you? Mm -mm, you just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I think too that when you have programs that go year after year, you just keep them. Yeah. You know, they just yeah, stay right. in the schedule. Mm -hmm. And then when you need to shake it up a little, when something happens and you need to say, wait a second, are these working? Mm -hmm. Are these being attended? Are they even of interest? Then you have to go through right. that process, right. and right. it scares some people, and they want to say no because leave everything the way it is. It's right. fine, but um, you know, like Jean, with the woman who recently um, resigned, Janine. Janine. Mm -hmm. um, when she said we used to be known for really having great services, and because of a lot of situations beyond our control, that is no longer the case. But that doesn't mean we can, you know, we can do it again. We can find out re what really does work. In a, in a little bit different direction, too. Yeah. And is you know, that like, like, it's that that we bit. don't have great services. Right. It may forward. just look that way. It might be just based on the past. Yes. And it may be kind of heavy with services that, 
you know, but very good ones also, you or, know, and very and very um, needed ones also. But because there are so many, it kind of gets lost in the shuffles, the important ones, or the priority of what's important. I was just going to say, Arlene, I think you know something about that. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you work for AD? Uh, about 25 years. Oh, wow. wow. I didn't realize she's a, that. She's a resident expert. <laughs> I don't know about expert. Honestly, just to wrap that topic up, um, I would not say that Longmont has lost its reputation area-wide as having a fabulous senior center. Mm -hmm. I still hear from people who say, we moved to Longmont for retirement mm -hmm. partly because yes. mm -hmm. of the senior center. So I think it's more accurate to say when the resignations happened, a bunch of people panicked and yeah. got some mm -hmm. local mm -hmm. negative publicity. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think of uh, what we offer and there's, there's classes, but I think the most important thing we offer is the resources. The resources. The resources. The resources. And that's I mean, the, finding out the, about resources. Mm -hmm. right. That's the key having for place success to come for to. seniors. Mm -hmm. You know, having one place to come to. And, and have an finish. answer for your questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me come back to that. Um, under vacancies, it's, this isn't exactly the right spot, but we do have a vacancy where the, we have an opportunity to have another liaison person to the Dakota County Area Aging Agency to talk that out. Um, I don't know, are you interested in that, Lonnie? Yeah. Or? Um, I had a good suggestion from Arlene. She said to talk to Janine and kind of get an idea of what it's about. I'm, I don't want to jump in and take on things and then not know what to do with it. Sure. But, so I would prefer talking to her first. Yeah. And I certainly don't want to jump in front of anybody else and be the one taking on all these responsibilities yeah. and stuff. But if it comes down to it, I'm going to speak to Janine. I'm going to find out more information about what exactly it entails. And then I can let you know at the next meeting. That's too late. Uh, oh. Is it the uh, deadline for the 13th? It's almost for, today. Uh, for an application. Maybe I can get her on the phone then. Do you think that would be appropriate to have a phone conversation? Uh, with well, I can tell you a little bit about what it's what it is. What it is. Okay. It is that they, they meet once a month, and it's about two and a half hours. It's the first Friday of every month. Okay. And they do meet at different locations through Boulder County. So, for instance, last Friday um, we met in Netherland. Now, okay. if you don't have transportation, they do provide transportation. Through via, but um, after that, it's up to you well, how much more you want to get involved. Okay. And didn't you say they also offer Zoom? Yes, they offer Zoom. Okay, so you don't yeah. have to attend in person. Yeah. That's important. Are most of yeah. the meetings Zoom? Uh, not no, they're they're both now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's both. They're so, hybrid. Yeah, so it's Boulder County, Boulder County the area Boulder agency Boulder on County. aging. Okay. Yeah, Boulder County. Yes. Area agency and aging, yeah. And until so, you get somebody, I can you know at least say a few things. But um, well, I think I'm I'm happy enough to go ahead and apply. I think it'd be wonderful. It is the right. thing to do, right? And I don't want to pressure you, but can you you know hurry up? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're running out of time here. Yeah. Um, no. yeah, I think I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. I think it, I, get involved. Actually, I thought about it myself. I thought it would be a really interesting group to work with. Right. But you know, I got, I got enough yeah. stuff. So, and this is outside that, of Longmont. This yeah. is Boulder County. So yeah. I'm going to be hearing a lot of information we may not hear. You know, more expansive. Yes, it's it's a great conversation. Okay. So you need to submit an application, is that right, Lonnie? Yeah. Okay, and then is that going to be an issue or is she just going to be appointed or is she going to be Okay, so the way that it works is probably similar to what you guys do, you know, with any of the councils, is that the applications will be turned into the uh, Boulder County Area Agency on Aging, and then at that point, um, people will be called and given an 
over the phone interview. Okay. Yeah, and then the information will go back to them as these are the people that should, you know we think are, need to be selected or that we need to approach or whatever. So yeah. Okay. And will they be selecting one or more than one? I believe there are five vacancies right now. Mm -hmm. But one, of course, is Longmont, the representative from Longmont. Okay. And there's several from at large, and then there are some from the Mountain Areas as well. Okay. Now, Janine is like at large. Janine is the representative from Longmont. Oh, she was. She, she was. was. Yes. Okay. What does she know? Oh, well, she has applied. She's not on She's the going to apply for an at large. Okay, so you are on at large. I'm at at large. Okay, mm -hmm. are you co chair? Yes. Okay, you're co chair of the group. Okay. Right. So, uh, All right. Well, we will. Um, if I you guess think you that would do well, if you think that would be something that, and it, you know, they they don't go around at the meetings and ask everybody to to say something. They have it pretty well prepacked with what's going on and, mm -hmm. and information that's available. Okay. And so yeah, it takes up the two and a half hours per team. Yeah, there's twenty-two and positions. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. You can take it from here then? Yeah, I will. Okay. Good. All right. Um, guidelines for the annual report. Um, here's a plan. Okay. And I don't, <clears throat> I want some reaction to this. Because this is just my thinking, and if you don't agree, I want you to say something. And, uh, and I'm going to articulate it as best I can. Last time we talked about uh, each area, each important area, a board member takes responsibility for it with the objective of when we get to our annual report, or it would include recommendations in that specific area to the city council. I had a question, by the way. Uh, Harold, for example, who does he take his orders from? Does he take orders <laughs> well, from the city council or a person on the city council? And then the department heads like uh, Pacheo, who does she report to directly to the city manager? Yes, well, the department heads, the, the, the top level reports directly to the city manager or the city attorney. The city attorney has a, a number of direct reports, and I don't think they have a man. They're not big enough to have a management hierarchy. So there's the city attorney. There is the city manager. The city manager takes direction from the city council and is responsible for carrying it out in terms of policy. But he is the ultimate authority in terms of operation, meaning which streets get right. paved first, first, and stuff like that. Now, obviously, he can't micromanage a staff this sure, size, so his yeah. directors really do most of that. Um, his personal policy is that the council has um, reasonable access. I think they're told to expect half an hour to an hour a week each from each city council member. So, you know, that's a lot of hours if, if, we, if we really yeah. used all of it. But he doesn't, he doesn't uh, restrict access to the senior staff very hard. Um, but he's he's the ultimate authority on all operations and uh, we, the city council collectively, are the ultimate authority on all policy and um, individual city councils have, have, council members have no authority whatsoever, just influence. So <laughs> that's kind of the way well, it works. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, so if, uh, one of the things I'd like to see when we make our recommendations, our report next summer, mm -hmm. you know, before budget, all that is spring. That, then. I'm sorry, spring, spring before budget because yeah, we, I said May last that. time. Yeah. Okay. Let's say by next May, um, we make our recommendations after a great deal of thought, and it goes. The letter goes to the city council, and. Uh, let's say that the, the recommendations are so good that you want to adopt three, two or three of them. Okay, and then what do you do? You direct Harold to say, okay, we think these are good recommendations and we'd like you to implement these recommendations through 
the staff, you know, like the human services. Yeah, normally the, the when a, a presentation like this happens, the the staff would or the the council would a accept the report if they don't have any, um, you know, find fault with it. They might ask you to go back and tell us more. You know, we can do that. Um, then we would temp temporary typically direct staff to come back and bring recommendations on how it should be implemented. The reason to, to staff. Right, and okay. the reason is because if we don't do it that way, we won't and stomp all over the structure of that the organization. Um, so usually it's a, it's a two-step process that way, and then sometime later, um, there would be recommend, you know, operational recommendations. I think an example would be, um, oh, opening up the youth center and and sharing some of that facilities uh, with you know giving seniors senior events access to some being held over there um, was the last time I could remember this organization resulting in um, uh, a recommendation by council that was implemented um, maybe another one uh, would be the transportation services between the LHA properties and the senior center. Um, so that kind of thing, uh, you know, again, it's the council says, yeah, this is an important thing, let's do something about that. Um, and then it comes back as a plan okay. that the council approves. Okay, so as a board, that's where I see us going. Go, go to make that. recommendations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Either that, if we don't do that, we're just cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good process. Right. Yeah. It's a good plan. It's, it's hard work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's tough work. Although I would also say that um, policy resolutions are an important process, part of that process. Because if, you know, if we write uh, a resolution, oh, okay, and saying that that we're a clearinghouse, which we essentially are, you know, uh, a no wrong door policy that says anybody can always call the senior center and we don't let go of them until they um, get an answer or get attached to the right service, um, which we may be understaffed for, you know, but um, that could be a, res a policy resolution that would then stay in effect and automatically inform budget decisions and so on. So that's another way of, of getting things into effect. Okay, well, I think we've got our work cut out for us. Okay, I'll, I'll, let me go on. I just want to clarify that, and, and for everybody so they kind of understand. I want to make sure everybody's on board. You know, we're going kind of the same direction here. But what I, what I see is that um, Last, last time we talked about who would take responsibility for um, uh, for housing, and it was Lonnie and uh, Sheila. Sheila. The two of you said who would take responsibility. Uh, I'm going to ask the same thing for transportation. So what I'd hope for uh, by next May, before that would have to be before May actually, is that we put into our report, I'm saying, I'm using the report as a vehicle, right, to the, to the city council. Something like we would describe the activity and define the activity. This is what the, this is what the senior center does as far as transportation is concerned. Now, that's why I was asking about your staff, you know, what connections do you have? Do you have specific staff, for example? You know, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. I'm just you know, asking the question. So, you kind of define the activity, list the activity, whatever. And then you go through um, maybe staffing and budgeting. I don't know, that's, that's kind of tricky, but staffing and budgeting recommendations, some benchmarks that can be followed um, as, far as, as far as what we think would be important movement in the area of transportation or housing or whatever it would be. You know, we are not experts in any of these areas. So all we're talking, what we're talking about, seems to me, are general kinds of 
benchmarks, that, but, but still measurable. That's all I was asking uh, Becky, if that's the sort of thing that could be done in subsequent years. You know, and I kind of can see get kind of a handle on this. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, we don't want to, we don't want to work at cross purposes with, with you at all. We, we're here to support you. Uh, and then finally, maybe a policy recommendation you know, those kinds of things, but you get the idea. So I'm talking about something that's going to take a, some work, think it through. Uh, what do you think we need in terms of, you know, staff, budget, policy, and the hard part, benchmarks. You know, that, that sort of thing. That, that's really the tough part. But, you know, if we don't, if, if we don't do something like that, we're just spitting in the wind, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We really are. Mm -hmm. So we've got to take a stab at it. So that's that's kind of my idea. And we do that for only a certain number of areas. I'm thinking we've already talked about um, uh, recruitment, not recruitment, but uh, outreach, outreach, housing, transportation, and yeah, maybe a couple of other areas. But we only have so much time to, to mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, some of this on year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Go ahead. May I suggest sure. severe weather response? Oh yeah. So key yeah. ambassadors, yes. people stuck in a, a, you know, a mobile home, um, uh, you know, help facilitating trans transit to a cooling center through the weekend. The senior center mm -hmm. used to be a cooling center. Um, you know, very the heat center. Heat uh, center. Well, yeah. it's a, a cooling yeah a heat yeah. center in the middle of winter. Yeah. But I suspect we're likely with a well. We, we have no idea what to we expect. Are. Exactly. Yeah. The weather has become just right. Yeah. So and, and so and that so so maybe part of that is making sure that the board, if we're going to make recommendations like that, know what's already there. Because I didn't know that there are heating center and or a cooling center. And, a cool cool center. Yeah. 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 and yeah. how well publicized is that? So do we have is part of our recommendation that the city yeah. publicize cooling centers better? Because it doesn't. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I think that definitely. I agree. I think that definitely should be uh, one of the areas we talk about. That almost become a new transportation. Yeah. 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 I don't. I would. I can work on transportation. I would. Okay. Transportation. Good. Excellent. Excellent. That was your focus uh, at Salt Lake County, was it not? One of them. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I told you. Jesus. That's good. <laughs> All right. That's and good. also, um, in the Marshall Fire, after the Marshall Fire, this mm -hmm. is a information center and that was very useful yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and the access does, center at Lafayette was actually a center for the people to come to school. does anybody want to work with Arlene on transportation I do take a shower occasionally <laughs> <laughs> anybody want to anybody well for the moment okay, no. <laughs> well, okay. Right. For the moment, I know you're more than capable of doing it yourself, but it would be good to just. Well, it's nice to have just more than it, one it's person. It's nice to have yeah. more than one I will lend a hand. We will lend a hand. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, Marsha, let me ask you this. Uh, on uh, the open meeting laws, mm -hmm. it would be good probably to meet with you periodically, maybe between now and then. Okay. So I can meet with board members freely because we're not a member of the same body. Okay, but so so the limitation is me and two or one members of the advisory board can meet. So we could have three person meetings. So what you want is to have subcommittees of two on each of these, which means that they can meet with each other freely and the pair can meet with each other. Well, but then I couldn't meet. So I, I would, I you would, can meet with me individually as the chairperson, right? Um, and 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 I can discuss what the board says, or the boards can report their progress to the entire board, and all of that is compliant. Right. Okay, but you can only have two people with you, right? From the same board, yes. Yes. So okay, so that means in Arlene's case. I could go with Arlene because there would only be two people mm -hmm. as far as uh, um, housing is concerned. You know, you and the two of you would go, unless one of you didn't, and I didn't. 
I want to get that out. Yeah, but you, <laughs> you, 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 you don't get to micromanage the committees yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, well, we'll work that out. But, uh, that's the idea. I see a lot of communication among ourselves and with the council actually before we get there too, uh, Marcia. And um, so that's going to take a little time, a little, a little work, but I think it's really going to be quite challenging. So anyway, that's what I'm thinking. That's, yeah. that's where we go. Yeah. Can we see about filling outreach in severe weather? Yeah. Uh, does somebody, uh, well, let's see, we haven't talked about that yet, but uh, yeah, what but do you mean? You, if um, you put severe weather under transportation, then that would be, oh, and, and that, that would be would, yeah, and that want to take, take yeah, well, but that, that's a okay. lot of responsibility. It is. Yeah. That's it is. Yeah. Well, I think but David has a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Well, David and Art, we can volunteer Art, who's not here. That's, <laughs> that's always good. good. That's what he gets. Yeah, that's, that's what he gets for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, uh, and you're not going to be able to fill positions until close to the end of the year, right? Yeah. From, from the oh, you're done with the positions. Oh, yeah. 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 The positions on the board, is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, is that like in November? It opens up, like yeah. over, it so opens up in, in, in October. And how many do we have? Two or one opens? Three. 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 Ooh, Three. No wonder we can't fill committees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I know at least one person who has who has sworn that he's going to get through the application process this time. Mm -hmm. Do we have people that could attend on an ad hoc basis or something like that? Is that possible? No? No? Uh -huh. Okay. You gotta scale your ambitions to your about. manpower. Yeah, and I just don't know what like outreach really is well, about. Outreach is. You mean uh, yeah, outreach? Well, I think all. Well, I think Art yeah. is going on the. He's sitting there. Okay. Art is going on the outreach. Okay. Whether he knows it or not. Anybody want to serve as part of the outreach committee? <laughs> well. It, and remember, it only has to be recommendations because the city has an outreach staff. Well, that's true. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, if if this body recommends that we do outreach on this subject and target it this way based on what we know about our community, then that should be enough for them to go on, and they can develop the brand and the message and the message in Spanish. You know, and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. We don't have to, and, and it's not our charter to do stuff end to end. It's right. just push. Yeah, yeah. Now, all we want to do is come up with what we think are good directions. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we can't deal with the details. We're not experts. Okay, well, that's I good. I can help Art with that. I'm sorry? I can talk to Art about that and help him with that. Okay. You good. know, and just see He'll, what he yeah. is He'll be, thinking. Yeah. I'll be glad to know you're on the committee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what time are we up? It's time to reports. Quick. Uh, I least. have one, so. Okay. Um, I want to. I have one other item to cover after your report. Okay. You, can you cover it? Oh, well, we should do the manager's report first. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Well, the way I had it set up, we kind of talked about it in the past. Is everyone had a chance to review it and we're just getting enough questions. Does anyone have any questions on the manager's report? Mm -mm. That was good. Yeah, you recovered. Mm -hmm. can, can I say on the reports, um, the idea was well, because we don't have enough time at the time to mm -hmm. give us the report mm -hmm. is to send them, send them. Well, I get Ronnie's and I know I send friends if there is a meeting. But I've never got anything from any of the other this, this month? AGM. No, ever. Oh. I've never got a sustainability um, area agency on aging report. Sorry. I see. Yeah. 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 Some some years on. yeah. Well, in this case, you can't have mine because I would have had to stay up until two in the morning to send oh, it. That's, 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 that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this, this last month, there was no friends meeting. I don't believe yeah, it. I didn't get it. Yes, there, there was a, a, a meeting, but it wasn't, it wasn't open to you. It wasn't a regular meeting. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never got one, two, three, four, well, five, we'll fix, five reports. We'll fix that. Yeah. yeah. So the past few months, uh, aside from this one, I didn't get any reports from anybody. Um, I, I, I attached them 
in my mm -hmm. email address or email with the agenda manager's report when anybody else is wants it that way or kind of review it in advance. Mm -hmm. um, but so if you don't send it, you don't have it. You know, you do not yeah. yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be instead of sitting here yeah. talking about it. But it's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. then, that opportunity to open it up if everyone had a chance to review the manager's okay. report, if you had any questions, if there are just questions about it. That's the problem. So, you can get things top to bottom. I've had questions yeah. on the floor and we never get to it. Oh, Marsha, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so the, the big deal, it was a mundane council meeting last night. You know, nobody raised a fuss in public and by you or anything. But, um, but we did refer three questions on public amenities to the ballot. Um, they are... Front page this morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I never get up early on Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah, top of the page, top of the Yeah, so, yeah, well, I'll, good, I'll take a look. That's good information, good intelligence. Um, what, they, what they did, um, the Center for Arts and Entertainment is referred that one has no new taxes for 2024 or 2025 unless, you know, because the alliance, the a capital campaign has to raise $35 million before the taxes can start. Um, so that's pretty far in the future. Um, and it also, no sales taxes start until the center is six months complete for completion because the sales tax operates the thing. Um, so uh, that's referred, um, and it uh, is a, uh, it's the property taxes that, that would handle a $40,000 bond issue. It's not gonna be done as a bond issue, but, uh, but it's still that much property taxes. Um, the uh, library um, branch and upscale, service scale, was referred to the ballot independently of whether there is a new rec center or not. Um, so they'll have some latitude if there's not, if the rec center doesn't pass, they'll have some latitude about doing it in a storefront or something like that. Um, and you make it a bigger or smaller branch, but you'll get a branch, you know, the, the, if it passes, the, then there will be a branch library somewhere in Longmont. And, uh, and then the last one, which was the only one that, that there was any significant debate, was the recreation center. And what the council decided to do, with me as a semi-dissenting voice, <laughs> was they um, smushed the YMCA proposal and the Dry Creek proposal together into one ballot question that's going to be $70,000 roughly. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, million, um, <laughs> seventy thousand dollars. Sure, no brainer. Yeah, <laughs> but um, uh, so um, it's a it's a big big dollar question. If it passes, we get new rec in the on uh, you know north side and new rec on the west side. Uh, if uh, you know, I have deep reservations about it because it's such a big ticket item but everybody else on the council thought that it would be more likely to pass if it had something for everyone. Um, so, sorry, does that include the Lashley um, yeah. exchange? That's yes, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the yeah. land swap, swap with the Y, which means two things. Okay, people will be able to use the Y pool instead of Centennial when, um, when Centennial pool is under demolition and um, and then the city gets the land once the new Y is built. So I love that one. Yeah. And I wanted it to be I wanted it to be by itself on the ballot because I don't I'm not that enthusiastic about the Dry Creek Center. I think it's a luxury and we could do it in a couple of years. Right. But that's not the way it went. Mm -hmm. well, and that's your bad. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. It yeah. just doesn't even make sense to me. Yeah. yeah. No. You're just so. making it almost impossible, you know, you're yeah. making it very difficult to pass. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, and I, frankly, I, you know, I'm a big supporter of the Center for Arts and Entertainment, and I think it, it reduces its ability to pass. Right. Because if, if somebody, really is into sports, 
they will vote no on this on this mm -hmm. matter for rights and entertainment because of sticker shock. So I don't like the way it came out, frankly, but um, the, you know everybody else on campus really pretty much spoke with one voice. So I did not cast a dissenting vote, um, but, you know because. And the thing about the arts and entertainment center is you're going to get income from outside London. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And the taxes. Center. Yeah, the tax taxes are far in the future too. Yeah. In the future. Yeah. But I think coming from a homeowner standpoint when I, I listened to everything and thought it through when you take a look at this particular thing is going to be this much mill mm -hmm. added this is going to be this much mill added on top of the additional sales taxes that is added not to even think about the you know the assessments that came through that were absolutely ridiculous and I don't know that I First off, the, 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 I'm not going to vote for all of those because of the meals. Mm -hmm. and no, I added tax. up the, the cost and the, the way they described it in the paper. It's two, over $200 increase in property tax for a $500,000 home. Yeah. That's tough. That, that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I want to tell you guys, I, I emphasized that message over and over right. again right. At, at, in public. Um, you know, I heard it from the optimists who are pretty much over 75, the whole the whole organization, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like the people who are making the decisions have either never been constrained financially mm -hmm. or, or um, never been old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Never been old. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, uh, it, it's back. Yeah. Uh, it's I, tough. I and when they see the no votes come in, yeah, they're going to say, we spent so much time and so much energy and we got nothing. Yeah. I'm afraid so. Yeah. That's where, that's, yeah. I think that's the handwriting on the wall. Yeah. yeah. And I hated to see that thing combined because, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was, yeah. Right. Yeah. It, especially since, I mean, I think everybody. Yeah, a lot of people hate the gray idea because it's just not all city, you know. And I mean, a lot of the public hates it. You know, I have a lot of emails. Really? From the spaces today. They said, well, we don't trust the light. We want it to be the city. We want it to be our recreation center that we know and love. Um, Change. Right. Yeah. Well, I've been around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Longer than long, yeah. longer yes. than Longmont is a city well, that had amenities and institutions. Yes, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, it's it's twelve o'clock. Yeah. No, sorry. Yeah. That so that's all right. Well, thank you. I'm actually, I'm trying to end this on time. Fail. I did. Yes. <laughs> okay. The red um, button is ready. <laughs> next, at the next meeting, I was thinking of this <coughs> one and uh, maybe we should get uh, support services here. Or maybe the resource specialists and talk about you know we've talked about some a lot of stuff maybe we should talk about have some of your staff or maybe you want to do it how we're involved how the senior center is involved in each of these areas because I, I don't have a good handle on it myself most of you don't uh, maybe just talk about that stuff for most of the meeting and then the, the area reports you know like sustainability the area that I, I, would, I follow I you know, I haven't really talked about it, you know, for a long time. I'd like, there are some things I'd like to say, and it goes right in with the heating, heat mitigation. You know, that's what we're doing right now. So I was thinking maybe this next meeting, we just kind of step back a little bit and talk about some of the stuff that we've been talking about the first few uh, meetings. I have uh, an illustration of the way the city prioritizes activities as a whole yep. that I will send to you that you can use to organize the discussion. Oh. If you would like. Okay. All right. Yeah. I All have right. to leave. Okay. I have to be in Lafayette at twelve thirty. <laughs> okay. All right. Like so. I just I just, just want to say, say one thing about the last meeting, the area agency on aging, which I thought was something to think about. Um, we had a person that is with the Area Agency on Aging in Washington City, who of course is you know really well acquainted with what's going on back there. And she said that one of the things that they are looking at that has been brought up is where do, why does every meal that, that a senior takes or want have to be at the senior center? Because some of your younger seniors are saying, why can't we go to Panera? 
you know, and meet there and then have it be the senior center meal that particular time or something, just different locations for it. And I thought that was something kind of interesting to think about. I don't know, you know, how that's going to work nationwide, but um, I just, yeah, it's just something different to think about. Would that be something that would bring in younger uh, seniors if we had, say, you know, a table at Panera or a picnic table somewhere or something like that? I just, I thought that was interesting that that came up. Hmm. That is. Mm -hmm. And I threw Panera out because I didn't know what else to say. Right. Yeah. They may be more mobile, younger seniors. Right. You know, they can go and meet at each place and it doesn't have to be where they get dropped off to come to the senior center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it could be maybe addition too. I still have people coming here that are used to right. coming here, but maybe have this little, little option of, you know, or go to a salad place or do, I, I don't know. Uh, Soup. Yes. Okay, good luck. Yeah, is there a second? Second. All right, moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion adjourned.